And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today, I'm here with the great Cy Kellett, the host of Catholic Answers. Cy, thank you for joining us. Gee, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we were just talking before about what a great topic we could, we could cover today. And what better than having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Amen, brother. Amen. And I, I think um, we Catholics have a great deal to say about a, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And we often don't say it uh, as clearly as we could because it could be helpful to a lot of people. Absolutely. And usually you hear this question from Protestants, well-meaning Protestants who are coming out and saying, well, do you Catholics have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Right. Exactly. And but but the um, the means that Jesus gives us for that personal relationship are much greater than that Protestant person, as you said, very well intentioned, uh, is, is uh, often aware of. And so we have to be in a position to share that Yes, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. First of all, you need to have that personal relationship with Jesus. But then also that I have the means to engage in that relationship on a very uh, deep level, profound level, because Jesus gave us those means. And we need to, and, and maybe in the case of the Protestant person, return to those because they're very, very valuable. Right. And sometimes we get caught up in maybe we have our we have our Angelus at noon, we have our rosary, we have our sacraments, we have our brown scapular, we have our miraculous medal, we have our stuff. Um, but a lot of times we get sucked into maybe almost like a, a clericalism where we're just going through the motions and our heart's not there. Now, I know it's not either or, it's both and. Talk about that a little bit. Well, that's very much the case. And I think sometimes we can think, um, we can, especially with, you know, on the most basic level, the Sunday obligation. Well, the fact that that's an obligation has a certain, it, it can create a certain kind of mental connection to that thing, a kind of a psychological approach to it that says, my primary, the, the primary concern of my religion is that I meet my obligations. And that's not the primary uh, concern of our religion. That's kind of a, a minimum that the church for the purposes of its governance and for the care of souls has to set. But that's not at all what our religion is about. Our religion is not about meeting just meeting obligations. And as you said, even when we take on a private uh, a spirituality or a, a, a devotion of a particular kind, we can often relate to it as if now we have this thing that we're doing, like say even we're doing a novena. As a Catholic, a, a novena is a powerful tool for, uh, for relating with God, relating with the kingdom of heaven. And, but we can treat it as, oh, I got to make sure for the next nine days I, I, I hit, you know, check all the boxes. Um, I'll just tell you something about one time I, I made a novena and I, and I completely, and I do believe that there was some providence in this, that I completely forgot one day of the novena. I just completely forgot it. So I asked a priest, what should I do? Should I just start, you know, do that day the next day and count that as nine days? Or should I start over at the beginning? Uh, and he said, you should do nothing you should continue with your novena because it's not about you getting each thing right. That's not what the novena is about. The novena is about you um, receiving from God. And he loves it when you mess up in a certain sense, when you make a mistake, because then it can become obvious. This is not magic. You're not doing a magical thing where, you know, if I just get the potion right, then I get God you're trying to relate to God. And so I thought that was a wonderful lesson that that priest gave me that it's not the novena that matters, it's you and God that matters and the novena is a tool uh, for that relationship. Right, and if we don't have that fire, like Christ said, if, if would, would that the world were already burning, right? Yeah, that we, exactly, if right. We don't have that fire. Sometimes we need to maybe change our prayer routine because maybe it gets too rote and repetitive and we, and we lose sight of, where is the God man? Where is Jesus Christ? I mean, that's, he's the center. Well, it's interesting that you'd say that about the fire, because the, the, that lighting of the fire, when, when Christ talks about that, he's talking about a fire that he is setting, a fire that he is making happen. And so I like to talk to people about the person of, of Peter in this regard, as far as the first steps in the Christian life. One of the things that is very important to note about Peter is he's a good man before he meets Jesus. He's a good, holy Jewish man. He's, he goes out to see John the Baptist. He's obviously involved in his faith. He's, he's committed in, in a profound way to his Jewish faith. 
And so often, and, and he's good for us because often people will say in the modern era, well, I'm a good person and that's what counts is being a good person. And in a certain sense, yes, that is what counts. That was very important in the life of Peter. But Christ's entry into the light of Peter takes that good person and just lights that life on fire. So that life becomes a totally world transforming life. There's very few people who have affected the history of the world like Peter has. And we still, you know, we refer to the Pope as Peter and we and our relationship with Peter and this church has Peter's name on it, an image on it, all because Christ came into his life. So we can easily have the view that, well, you know, I'm good enough. I'm, I'm muddling through, I'm meeting my obligations and all that. And that's true. But if you meet Jesus, all of that is on fire in a, in a new way. And this is the thing that I think many Catholics need to be reminded of is that you, if Christ hasn't walked into your life, like he walked into Peter's life, invite him, ask him, walk into my life because I want to be fully alive. I don't want to just be good enough. I, and, and frankly, if you're just good enough, you know, you'll muddle through life and you'll do fine. And, and at the last judgment, I'm sure that God will be happy with you. He doesn't, he's not looking to condemn us, but you want to be fully alive, then invite him to come into your life like he came into Peter's life. Right. And that's, that's what would make then the devotions fruitful, right? We, we want those devotions, those um, glances throughout the day at religious images, the regular invocations, the affections right. of the heart, the good resolutions, all of our Catholic stuff. But we want to make sure we don't turn it into all about me. What am I doing? I'm making it happen. And there's there's always that that creeps in. Yeah, uh, our, our our chaplain here, Father Hugh Barber, says that it is about us in the, in the same way that it's about like a, a little child who's helping mom cook dinner. You know, like mom doesn't need the help. <laughs> it's still important for the little child to help. You know, it's for the building up of the relationship. But it would be easier for mom if the kid wasn't there. So you know, God can do all this without us, uh, but except that he doesn't, he, he often waits for us. He's patient with us. He wants us to take it on as our own thing as well. And when you talk about these, the, all these devotions or, or things that we might have, they also take on a different meaning after the encounter with Jesus than before the encounter with Jesus. They can be reminders of the encounter now, instead of just aspirations of something I want in the future, they can re remind me of something that I already have. And then we get into what Peter did. The, the, the kind of next thing with Peter is he walked around with Jesus for three years. Well, that's in many ways, that's what these religious images are for, what our rosary is for, what our whatever our devotion is, it's our time walking around with Jesus so that we can become more like him. And this too is a personal relationship with Jesus, but not a just a me and Jesus one. You know, you pray the rosary with other people, you share your devotions with other people, you are your relationships with saints are very, very important. Uh, and and also probably most important of all of it, your acts of charity are very important in imitation of Jesus. You know, are you kind to the person you meet, you know, going into the store? And are, you know, I, I think Fulton Sheen said once, somebody asked him to sum up the Christian life in three words, and he said, kindness, kindness, kindness. You know, and it's true, kindness, God's kindness towards us, and then our kindness towards others. So this is the kind of second step in that process of, that Peter went through. And we call it, we Catholics call it conversion. And often our Protestant brothers and sisters don't, they think of conversion as like a, a switch that, but, but that's what we call the encounter, the meeting. Conversion is the hard work of walking with Jesus for three years, like Peter did. And, and for most of us, it's for 30 years or 50 years or, you know, or however long it may be that the Lord gives us. Right. And the falls, the defects, the picking ourselves back up, that's all part of that conversion process, the discouragement. Peter jumped out of the boat because he's Peter, but then he started to sink. That's us again and again and again. We shouldn't worry about that at all. I mean, in a certain sense, the, the Lord is the least interested person in our sins, in our, in our mess ups. He, he just, that's not his preoccupation. He's, he knows what he's making of us. That's his preoccupation. He knows what we're going to be when this process is done. Stop worrying about the, you know, you try to overcome sin every day, especially sins against charity, where you might be uncharitable to other people. But he's worried, he, you know, he's doing the work. In other words, just like with Peter, Peter followed, 
Peter slept outdoors. Peter did all those things with Jesus, but it was Jesus who was doing the work. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of times we make it almost too one-sided where our prayers are always maybe speaking, not enough listening. What does the Lord want for me? That's not a relationship. That's, that's one person. <laughs> you know, if I may say too, I think the even beyond listening, the primary prayer of a Catholic is simple receptivity, just receiving so that the most important prayer you do is to receive the Eucharist onto your tongue. That's prayer. It's just reception. You don't, well, you're like, well, you know, I often don't feel worthy or I don't have any of, none of that matters. You're receiving. And I, I think that that's why the, in the modern times, the whole move towards Eucharistic adoration, which is even something the medieval people didn't really do. They didn't do Eucharistic adoration. That's a modern thing, Eucharistic adoration. And I think the reason is we live in a different kind of society where we need time where we just simply receive from God, where nothing else. And that's, how, I think, the attitude we should have in adoration. I am here to receive you. I'm just sitting here being receptive so that we can be friends. That's the adoration that he wants, is the adoration of friendship uh, with us. So yes, listening, but also just pure confidence that when you receive the Eucharist, that reception is the best possible prayer that you can make. Being receptive is the key to Catholic life and Christian life in general, of course. Right. It's what's Christ do, what Christ is doing in our life as opposed yeah. to what we're doing. Right. And we see that in Peter as well. He didn't even know what was going on at the Last Supper. I, I'm sure that he, he was like, what? This is my body. This is my like, what? He doesn't have a clue. But that moment of communion, that's the one, by the way, that moment of communion is the one that we really need to invite our Protestant brothers and sisters to. You want a personal relationship with Jesus? Receive him on your tongue. Receive the living Lord on your tongue. That's a personal relationship with Jesus. Right. Uh, makes perfect sense. What are some of their biggest um, maybe hang ups on that? Not, not hang ups, but they're, they're, what's blocking them the most from doing that when we invite them to take that step forward into an even closer relationship? What do you see? How do we overcome it? Uh, it, it seems to me that the primary obstacle uh, throughout the whole history of, of Protestantism is not one of receptivity. There's a perfect willingness to receive Christ. It's an unwillingness to receive Christ from the hands of another person that I, ha I will only receive Christ if I receive him directly. That's not the apostolic faith. And so uh, now, the pro so the Protestant person experiences that as an intellectual objection to priesthood, an intellectual objection to purgatory. And, it, and, and these are perfect, I, I'm not saying that these are, um, that these rejections are just, you know, of bad faith on the part of the, there's, there's intellectual reasons for the Protestant Reformation. But God made a religion in which you receive him from the hands of another person. You receive his forgiveness from the mouth of another person. And this is a communal religion, a, a, a communion. That's what, and so it's not a failure to be receptive to Jesus. It's a failure to be receptive to Jesus in the way that he offered himself, which is at the hands of another person. And frankly, a priest. He gave us priests. St. Paul is a priest of Christ. And, and St. Peter is a priest of Christ. And so uh, there's a, you have to accept priesthood. If you want to be, have a personal relationship with Jesus, you got to see Jesus is offering that to you at the hands of a priest. That makes a lot of sense. And it's absolutely biblical because when Christ divided the loaves, the apostles distributed them. So Isn't that beautiful, right? Another person. Yes. And, and you see it again and again and again. I mean, this weird statement that uh, Jesus makes in, I think it's in Matt, uh, no, it's maybe in Luke's gospel, where he says, I've seen Satan fall like lightning. He, from the, he never says that anywhere else. It's the weirdest thing. When, did, when does he say that? When the apostles and disciples come back from the mission he sent them on to cast out demons, to heal people, and to preach the kingdom of God. Well, that's what the church does casts out demons, heals people, and preaches the kingdom of God. He, Satan falls at the moment that the church is united with Jesus, not when me in my personal relationship, you know, in my room or something, makes that commitment. That is very important. But Jesus says, I have seen Satan fall like lightning. When? When the church is doing the sacramental work that he gave it. 
and it's it's like they are almost that makes sense and it's almost like they're there with with baptism because they accept that from another person but maybe right. it's just because for them that's more symbolic and the real thing is them asking christ into their heart right yeah i think that that may may be the case i mean protestant protestantism is now so varied that you have uh, from a very liturgical you know kind of protestantism among the you know the liturgical lutherans and anglicans all the way to a really it's just the word you know only the and, and that tends to be kind of the the more modern uh kind of uh mega churches that kind of thing right right the other thing that as you're speaking it, it's um bringing up to my mind i think about the beautiful carmelite spirituality i think of saint john of the cross about before when you said about the receptivity and allowing god to act in us even if we don't feel any consolations we don't feel the um, all the good feelings, the warm yeah, and right. fuzzy. Talk about that a little bit. Well, about we just say talk well, about the just just about the Carmelite spirituality and how that relates to the um, relationship and how it's what God's doing in us. And yes, it's not necessarily the feelings because I'm sure you probably hear from a lot of people's side where they say I don't feel I just it, don't feel it, or I was feeling it and then I lost it. It's funny that you should say the Carmelites because to me. Um, St. Teresa of Avila was kind of my introduction to a, a relationship with Jesus, a prayer relationship with Jesus. And I remember reading The Way of Perfection when I, I think I was 19 or 20 when I read The Way of Perfection. And I really wasn't prepared to read it. I don't know if you've ever had this experience of you read a great spiritual work and it's really so far above you that you're, you're kind of barely pawing at the bottom of it, you know, like trying to hold on. And I, I can't say that I understand it understood i didn't understand and i don't and i'm still teresa is far above me and and john of the cross you know but the the sense i mean i suppose i'm attracted to teresa's carmel like life more than john's in the sense that she's more worldly than he is in a way that he is just so profound i mean he's the one who said about his own death i will be god by participation meaning he will he's so deeply uh kind of connected to this participating in the inner life of god that he is otherworldly in many ways and beautifully and people that are are much greater spiritual adepts than me you know they john is just the great mystic of all time but to me teresa her kind of earthiness her her sense of humor all that i think i can tag along with teresa more easily than with even though she's far far above me that more easily than with John of the Cross. Yeah, well, that makes well, sense. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the things that I remember with her that she's the interior castle, right? The right. different mansions. Yes, right. And she so, has this incredible vision of the interior life, but I just wasn't prepared for it when I first read it. I mean, it it it, it almost was like a, there's a world that you don't know about, and here's a little window into it, and it doesn't make sense to you and all that, but it's at least an invitation into a a world of prayer and presence to God and also interior transformation that I didn't have a clue about before that I read her, you know? Yeah. yeah. And now you probably deal with atheists a lot, very frequently, I'm sure. Right. And let's say they have no, maybe they have no religious experience at all whatsoever. And that might be yeah. very different than someone who has religious experience in the past but now they got turned off from the church in a certain way. Talk right. about how you deal with each of them and how you would draw them more into that relationship with Christ. Okay, and this is providential because you're talking about the last step in the, in the Christian life of intimacy with Jesus. If the first one is to meet him and the second right. one is to walk with him and become like him. And the third one is to share in communion, the communion that he offers. The fourth one and the, the one that the Second Vatican Council insists that we all have to do is mission. You've got to go out and invite other people into this. So that's what we think about all the time here at Catholic Answers is how, how do we do this? Because in many, to many people, we are speaking a foreign language. We're talking about things that right. um, they believe that they have understood because they took a world religions class or something, but they don't understand. They don't have any concept really of what it is that these categories don't make any sense to them so i mean i i think part of it is a kind of a one question at a time approach as the question comes up you deal with what the person actually asked and maybe you 
open a little bit of a window into the next thing. Do you want to go there? And you kind of go with them if they want to keep uh, going there. And then a lot of it also has to do with saying what we're not, you know, like, I mean, frankly, with the atheists, you know, the atheists will say, well, I believe in science. And then you just go, well, we, we tell you what, Catholics invented science. So we believe, and that, that drives them crazy, but at least it starts the conversation, you know, like, hey, did you know that the one of the greatest scientists at the foundation of science was Pope Sylvester II? Look it up, you know, and then they're like, no, a medieval pope was a great scientist? Yes, as a matter of fact. So that, that's, you know, you could just, just pope scientists, you could make an impact on an atheist. So in some ways we have the advantage because the atheist has been miseducated. Right. You know, they've been educated to believe things that are just not true about history and about the Catholic faith. Uh, the person who has rejected the faith, it's, if they've been hurt, you know, you have to be a, a mode of healing. You just have to be, I, I don't know what else to do because the, the truth is that Satan's been very active in the church hurting people and abusing them and, and nasty, horrible things have gone on. And, and so I, I, I don't know, I, I always, I don't think I'm very good at that, frankly, because I just feel like one, you, you realize the depth of the hurt and then you, you are almost speechless before it. You feel like uh, I'll pray for you. I'm sorry that happened. I, but there's, I don't have the next step after that. Um, I don't have a good next step, but you know, I suppose the next step is that, but you know, Jesus loves you, but even the idea of love has been so distorted to the person who's been hurt like that, that it, it's almost meaningless to them. Well, I think you bring up a good point there, Sai, which actually does help people with this is to be able to discern, is this an intellectual problem they have with the faith or is this an emotional problem? Right. And not necessarily pounding them with the emotions and everything or the pounding them with the in intellectual arguments that we know that we might want to be excited to get across when right. they're suffering instead of being with them with the suffering. It's so funny because Carl Keating, who's the founder of Catholic Answers, said one time, I asked him this very question that you're asking me on the air because he's a great apologist. And he said, there's often two levels to a thing. There's the question the person has, and then there's the problem the person has. And what you, you wanna answer the question without making the problem worse, basically, by, by addressing. And so the problem may be, you know, my father was a very religious person, but he divorced my mother. And, and, he, and so I feel abandoned by this person who expressed great faith. Well, so the person, the question is about why does God allowed su allow suffering, for example. But the problem is a completely different thing. And if you can get to the problem, then, uh, then, we, then we're dealing on a human level and then we can share Christ on a human level. Right. Right. I remember something similar. I think it was in a Harvard business book that I read because, you know, my, my interests are business and, and faith. And one of the things they spoke about is there's always that it's something going on the surf under the surface, the people problem, they call it. Yeah. And make sure you're not ignoring the people problem and dealing with something else. You have to deal with the people problem first. Right. And, we, and we're in a weird position because we answer questions on the radio, you know, so you want to answer the question. But I mean, the, uh, but you also want to address the person. So sometimes you can feel it. You go all right, we answered that person's question, but that person didn't hear it at all. But then you got to, on radio, you're like, well, there's a hundred, a thousand other people listening. Maybe somebody else heard it. And that's part of the key of radio too, is and a part of reason why I really love radio is people listen to it alone in their car. And so they can process these things in a different way than if they were watching it on television with someone or uh, even in a conversation, they can just hear the word proclaimed. And if it resonates, they are alone and they don't have to be ashamed or defensive. They can just process it. And lots of people have come to Jesus sitting in their car because they heard what somebody was saying. It's really remarkable, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're so great for the work, the work that you do and the Catholic Answers does, and, and all the great Catholic organizations that are doing things like this, because you're right, the people really need it. And they might, you might answer them then, but then they watch it again on YouTube. They could watch it over and over again. And, yeah. and they, learn it. they might not get it the first time they hear, but maybe the second time or third time. And right. What I've, always, right. what I've always noticed firsthand when, when, you're, when you guys are doing this, 
you're very loving and very good with the people and patient with them. But at the same time, you do have to give an answer because they're, you're, you're speaking to a much broader audience who are concerned with that answer. Yeah. And sometimes the answer is harsh. You know, right. sometimes the answer right. is harsh. The person who's, who's, uh, you know, living with the boyfriend or girlfriend and that person was educated that that's perfectly fine and normal. They, they're not a bad person. They just were miseducated about the proper place of sex in, in human life, but you can't lie to them. You can't go, Hey, don't worry about it. You know, you got to tell them the truth. Uh, and then there's that. And again, there's always those other people who are listening in the, in the car, the parent who wants to communicate that to the kid, you know, and doesn't, and that's not always easy to communicate to the kid or just the person who needs to be convicted of that in their life that, yes, this is, this is the truth that ice called a chastity is the truth. Absolutely. Great stuff. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I hope everyone watching or when you're watching this after it's recorded, that you take some notes, jot down some information because so many great points you made there. So I really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful to, to you for having me. And God bless you in your endeavors. Thank you for doing this. I, you're right at the cutting edge of a revolution in Catholic media where we really, uh, I mean, I, the Holy Spirit is moving and you're part of that movement and, and God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much, Sai. God bless you. God bless Catholic Answers. Amen, Take brother. Care.